Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are calling to order Senate Judiciary Committee, so thank you for joining. Today, uh, we will be hearing a bill that was a similar bill in the Senate, has been um, heard in the House and passed out of the House and sent over to the Senate for consideration here in our committee. So with that then, we will open the hearing on HB 2078 and ask for our reviser, Mr. Thompson, for a bill brief. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, committee. This is Jason Thompson with the Office of Reviser of Statutes. Um, House Bill 2078, as amended by the House Committee, suspends statutory speedy trial rights until May 1st of 2024 in all criminal cases and provides guidelines for prioritizing trials. So the bill amends KSA 22-3402, which of course provides the statutory speedy trial requirement in criminal cases. As introduced, you may recall you had the, the same language. Uh, the bill would have suspended the statutory speedy trial requirement in all criminal cases filed prior to the effective date of the act until May 1st, 2024. And it also would have eliminated the speedy trial requirement for all criminal cases filed on or after the effective date of this act. Uh, the House Committee on Judiciary <clears throat> retained language suspending the statutory speedy trial requirement until May 1st of 2024, but made it applicable to all criminal cases. And the House Committee also removed the provision that would have eliminated the speedy trial requirement. The House Committee also added a new subsection K to provide relevant factors the trial court shall consider when prioritizing cases for trial. Uh, it's a non-exclusive list, uh, so it's including but not limited to and the items are listed there in the bill and in the bill brief for your reference. Uh, new subsection L remains as introduced and provides that the amendments made to this section are procedural in nature and will be construed and applied retroactively, or you at least intend them to be uh, construed and applied retroactively. And of course, if passed, uh, the bill would take effect on publication in the Kansas Register. Uh, stand for questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson. I want to remind the committee we have heard uh, the Senate version of this bill uh, prior to its amendment. If you recall, the committee thought it would be a good idea to hear directly from the judicial branch and the executive branch. So then we had a full hearing, um, hearing from both of those entities about uh, what the judicial branch has been doing to respond to the COVID-19 um, event and pandemic and what they've been doing to um, keep the courts open as best they can. We also, after our Senate bill hearing, asked the, um, the prosecutors and the defense bar to please uh, speak together and come up with a compromise, and they did, and that compromise was incorporated by the House Judiciary Committee in their amendment that you now have before you, uh, which is House Bill 2078 as amended. You'll see that Section K. Um, and that, again, um, is the uh, compromise reached by, again, the uh, prosecutors and the defense bar. Um, and it keeps the date of May 1, 2024 in there. Um, I have a quick question, Mr. Thompson. Uh, Section L has some um, legal significance, does it not, that we're talking about that the amendments are procedural in nature and not substantive? Could you explain what impact that has? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Jason Thompson again. Um, generally speaking, uh, substantive changes to criminal procedure and criminal law cannot be uh, applied retroactively. Uh, procedural changes may be applied retroactively uh, in order to have the court look at them and consider whether they would apply retroactively. The legislature needs to make an affirmative statement that it intends for them to be applied retroactively. So by putting that statement in here, you allow the prosecutors to uh, make that argument that they are procedural, that they are retroactive, that they are intended to be retroactive, and then the court um, would generally recognize that that's permissible. Um, they, of course, could find that they're not procedural and not allow them to apply retroactively. But I think in this case, all the parties agree that uh, by having this statement in there, the court would find that they are procedural and it would apply them retroactively. But the statement needs to be there uh, in order to make that argument. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. Committee, any questions for the reviser? 
Seeing none, then we will invite our first proponent conferee, Mr. Mark Bennett, Sedgwick County District Attorney. Uh, please introduce yourself and welcome again to committee. Make sure you turn on the microphone, please. Thank you very much, Senator. Yeah, that's much better. Uh, Mark Bennett, District Attorney, Sedgwick County. So uh, we're back on what is now House Bill 2078. Um, when I was here before testifying about Senate Bill 57, I went through a number of um, concerns, and I won't hit you with everything again. You know, try to make good use of your time, but. Um, just to, to frame this again, the situation we find ourselves in is that while courts have been opened and we have been able to get work done, there is one type of case that cannot be resolved, and that is a jury trial. Um, we can't do jury trials by platform, by, you know, Zoom, that sort of thing. We have a, a defendant has a right to face his or her accusers in an open courtroom, looking them, you know, across the, the courtroom with counsel there to, to, to subject the witness to cross-examination in front of a jury who is also seated right there. And so with that limitation, uh, it has been very difficult, um, if not impossible, to, to seat jurors at nearly the pace that we would have uh, pre-COVID. And so there has built up this backlog. So how to address it? Uh, the, the reality is the constitutional right to a speedy trial, whether it's Kansas Constitution or uh, United States Constitution, is inviolate. We can't change that. Nothing that we are doing here today affects that but it can affect the statutory right to a speedy trial, which at this point says 150 days if you're in custody, 180 if you're out. Um, after the last hearing, uh, Senator Warren mentioned a moment ago, there was a request uh, by this body that uh, the DA's Association and the Kansas Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers get together and see if we couldn't come up with a, a solution because <clears throat> both sides really uh, agreed that this is an issue that faces the courts. Uh, and uh, what's the best way to do that? And so we came up with, took your challenge and said, that's fine. We sat down and <clears throat> came up with what you see before you today, which is now House Bill 2078. And what the bill does, uh, number one, we uh, jettisoned uh, subsection K, which was the uh, notion that the bill would be repealed after its uh, speedy trial would be repealed altogether after its passage. That's off the table. We recognize the time's not right for that conversation. But what it does as subsection J, it suspends speedy trial until May of 24, and then helps us uh, uniform the prioritization of cases across the state uh, by setting forth six factors that judges are to rely upon. Um, the, the trial court's calendar, what's the, cal what's the court able to do? Uh, the relative prejudice to the defendant, look, I've got to get my case to trial because I've got a witness who's leaving the state. I've got a elderly witness who, you know, is in, in bad shape uh, health-wise. Those kinds of things, and so that can help prioritize. Uh, there's, there's six of them. Uh, these, these factors were not pulled out of thin air. Uh, many of them are tied directly back to the United States Supreme Court case law. Uh, Barker versus Wingo is one of those seminal cases in the practice of criminal law. Uh, I mentioned it in my previous testimony and went at great length in my earlier testimony regarding House or Senate Bill 57. Um, it's a 1972 decision, and it talks about the length of the delay, the reason for the delay, the defendant's assertion of his or her rights, and the prejudice to the, to the defendant. And so using that framework, we plug those in here, as well as uh, recognizing, uh, especially number six, uh, factor number six, uh, the relative safety of the proceedings to participants as a result of the COVID response of that judicial district. That's something that is paying homage to the reality we face here. So with that uh, compromise, the parties agreed that this we thought was a workable framework. I will tell you too that uh, the DA's association, I haven't even had a chance to share this with Ms. Glenn Denning, and I assume she'd be uh, supportive, but we've talked about uh, doing some training among Probably at this point it'll have to be online, uh, but doing training for all the prosecutors in the state uh, to suggest that they that we utilize and put together a uniform um, journal entry or order that judges would utilize to make sure that, that this bill is complied with in a uniform fashion, um, and making sure that as we as we as the courts begin to gear back up and have jury trials and bring jurors into courtrooms around the, the state, that we're doing so in a uniform manner that complies with this statute, and so that's a. Maybe the next step that we're going to uh, 
uh, and bring to, to bear uh, to give voice to this law should it pass. Um, a couple final thoughts. Uh, I won't take up all your time here, but a couple final thoughts of things that I know were uh, questions that were raised last time I was here. I already talked about the factors and where those come from and why they're grounded in a long established 50 year, nearly, I guess, 49 years worth of uh, United States Supreme Court case law. Um, the effective date, we changed that language, uh, and that's because um, up here in J, this section shall apply, uh, excuse me, the provisions of the section shall apply, um, um, what am I trying to say here, in all cases. Um, the idea being that this then would be the groundwork that all cases, judges are going to have to say, well, wait a minute, this one's newer, this one's older, and we're, you know, uh, this one fits the bill, this one is subject to the changes, this one isn't. That would call it, I mean, that would be very difficult. And so this, this fix would apply to all pending and all new cases filed until the, the, the sunset on the provision. Uh, so there's uniformity. Uh, the constitutional versus statutory speedy trial, I think we've all at this point understand that this is in no way an infringement on anyone's constitutional rights. This is a statutory right granted by the state. The state has the power to change a right that you've given statutorily by fixing or amending that statute. Um, two final thoughts. Uh, the idea of a two-year versus a three-year stay. I know that was a concern at one point. Uh, I think the, con the, the reality, though, of the situation is that if we were open right now, if the state could be open for business, um, and I'm not talking in some philosophical sense or trying to delve into the politics of it. I'm just talking the, the nuts and bolts of it. When I go back to my courthouse, there are still um, safety protocol in place. This year, we're already in March. It will be likely May, June before we are beginning the, foot, the, the big push to try to get things going again. That gives me six months in this year, 2021, and I would have all of 2022. Um, and we'd be back here before the legislature, the session in 2023. I'm not, I don't believe that 18 months is going to be enough to get this worked to down, um, which is why we've asked for three years. It's a three-year ask, which is going to give us effectively two, two and a half. I would say that there is always the possibility as a, as a um, fail-safe or a uh, compromise that we could come back or the, the, the OJA or the Supreme Court, somebody could in the various uh, courthouses around the, the state, we could provide a report too at the end of 2022, 20, 20, I guess, 23, if we are, to tell you where we're at, uh, if at some point there's a reason to, to uh, some belief that we need to sunset this a year earlier. But I'd rather have the, the window open uh, and for three years uh, than not. Um, those are the main points. Uh, the final thing I'll say is that um, you know, we, we, <clears throat> I think everyone understands the urgency here. If we don't move by March 31st and have this bill in place, um, the existing uh, provisions which have allowed speedy trial to be suspended by the Supreme Court uh, will sunset by virtue of the uh, emergency powers bill that was passed last fall. Um, and that's, that becomes obviously very problematic because we're trying right now to set these cases and fill our calendars through the summer and the fall, and frankly, in some jurisdictions, even into next year already. So the sooner we can get this thing passed uh, and have this sort of sort of Damocles removed from hanging over us, uh, the better for all the practitioners, the better for the courts, the defense bar, the prosecutors, uh, and, and getting these cases calendared and starting to get them resolved. So um, that's the pitch. That's the idea. And frankly, I think it's a, uh, it speaks to the um, efficacy of this bill and, and why it's the appropriate bill that the parties, the defense bar and the prosecutors got together and recognized this is the, the path forward and this is the recommendation we've, we've brought to you. So I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Uh, we'll go ahead and hear from the proponents and then we'll come back for questions. Yes, um, to all the proponents. Um, next, uh, we have our next proponent conferee, Mr. Steve Howe, Johnson County District Attorney um, from where my Senate district is. So um, good to have you back again, Mr. Howe. Welcome back to committee. Uh, I understand you're joining us on WebEx, so please introduce yourself. And uh, nice to have you with us again. 
Chairwoman Warren and members of the judiciary. My name is Steve Howe, Johnson County District Attorney, and thank you for the opportunity of doing this by WebEx. Uh, my calendar um, is pretty jammed up this week, and so I appreciate the opportunity to do this by video. Uh, this, me doing this by video kind of highlights part of what the courts have been doing for some time now, which is they've been doing extensive number of hearings day in and day out by video. And as Mark indicated, uh, we do thousands of hearings each week. Um, our judges are typically doing uh, video conferencing, doing all types of hearings from nine to five. But again, the one caveat is jury trials. In my testimony, I supplemented it with kind of a, how that scenario would play out if you pass this bill and how long it would take for us to dig out of this backlog. And I know uh, Chairwoman uh, Warren and others were concerned about the two versus three years. And so when I spelled that out in my written testimony, uh, being the biggest jurisdiction in the state, how long it would take for us to dig out of that backlog. Um, and it is uh, not an exaggeration that best case scenario it would take two years, but it also doesn't incorporate the fact that in those two years that we're gonna be digging out this backlog, I continue to have cases coming into my jurisdiction. And I think what's important to understand, this isn't just the big jurisdiction because, uh, you know, Brandon Jones who uh, is south of me in uh, Franklin County indicated his limited resources there. And so it's all proportional. And he's gonna be facing the same thing at a smaller number level, but the same lack of resources to be able to dig out in, a, in just a small amount of time. Some of the things that I also wanted to highlight, um, and I think Jessica Glenn Denning, who's on, would probably attest to this. Um, there's a limited number of criminal defense attorneys who can try some of these cases. And the problem is on court appointed uh, matters is it's, it's not reasonable to expect that the criminal defense bar can go back to back to back to back weeks in trial and give their client um, the proper representation. And so that also plays a role in the fact that as I've played it out, 50 consecutive weeks of every week, every court trying a case is not reasonable for even that additional uh, criteria or, or, or component. And I want uh, this body to know that the hesitation of the courts in many respects is based on their concern about potential jurors being brought into the courtroom. As you know, there is a good portion of our potential jurors that are senior citizens who are just now receiving their vaccines. And so the concern, again, as I laid out in my testimony, bringing in hundreds and hundreds of individuals, including those who have not been vaccinated, could be a health risk. And our health department was concerned about that in Johnson County. And that would play out throughout the state. And so that is a, a major consideration that, and the reason why the courts have been hesitating about doing large numbers of jury trials, even if you had masks and, and plexiglass separating people, there are still some major health concerns and that has played a huge role in those considerations. The other thing is, uh, as Mark alluded to, um, the Chief Justice just issued a, an executive uh, update and indicating that she would not extend uh, the executive orders beyond April 15th of this year. So that means that we're on the clock. That, I mean, the speedy trial uh, balloon would pop and we would be on the clock um, to try all those cases within either 150 or 180 days. And I think what's important here is to understand that as a prosecutor, and I've been doing this for 30 years, the last thing I want to do is delay bringing that case to court. Uh, people's memories fade, evidence does not get better over time. And the last thing I want to do is delay justice or delay bringing this case to court. So it, it is incumbent upon us to want to do it in a uh, swift and effective way to bring justice, not only 
to our victims in our community, but also to the accused who, who uh, in some instances are in custody. So I think there's a variety of reasons why this bill makes sense. The reasons why we're asking for three years, it's not because we're just asking, um, but because of our, if you look at the raw numbers, it's gonna take that long to dig out of this. And, you know, really our job in the criminal justice system is to bring justice for everybody. And that three year stay of the speedy trial clock will bring justice for people, again, the accused and the victims and the community. And I think that's what's important. And I want you to know that, uh, as I indicated in my written testimony, this isn't a Republican or Democrat issue. This is about bringing justice to all Kansans uh, and affording uh, the, the rights of all individuals to see that justice is done in the cases that involve them. And so I would ask this body to please pass this bill um, out of your committee. It's extremely important. If we don't do it, frankly, uh, I'm not exaggerating. There will be individuals who are accused of very serious crimes that could potentially walk out the jailhouse door and not bring justice to our victims and also put our communities at risk. And that's how dire this situation is. And I'm not one to exaggerate things, but that's how dire it is. And it's nobody's fault. It's it, it, No one is at fault because of this situation. And I think this body uh, recognized that there is a reason to uh, figure out a compromise that works for everyone. And I, I know Jessica's online and I appreciate her being very reasonable and objective in her position and allowing us to come up with a compromise that uh, works for everybody. And I give her a lot of credit uh, for that uh, in her representation. And I think this is a good working solution for something, again, that is nobody's fault. So I would ask this body to pass this bill out and give our ability to afford justice to all Kansans uh, based on um, something that was totally out of our control, which is a pandemic thrust upon us. That's all I have, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, to all of you today. Thank you, Mr. Howe. Appreciate the testimony. Um, committee, next we will hear from proponent conferee, Mr. Jeff Easter, sheriff, and uh, here on behalf of the Kansas Sheriff's Association, also joining us by WebEx. Please introduce yourself, Mr. Easter, and welcome back to committee. Uh, Thank you, Chairwoman uh, Warren. Um, thank you to the uh, committee for listening to us today. My name is Jeff Easter. I'm a sheriff in Sedgwick County, Can or Sedgwick County uh, here in Kansas, and also the legislative chair for the Kansas Sheriff's Association. I'll be very brief. Uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Howell, Mr. Bennett have covered the reasons why uh, this is so important. Uh, in Sedgwick County, um, in 2020, uh, filed 2,400 felony cases. I had tried 26 jury trials prior to the shutdown, uh, but by way of comparison in 2019, uh, Central County filed, or the DA's office filed 3,714 adult criminal cases uh, and resolved 2,265 cases. Uh, there were 16,017 separate settings for preliminary hearings and 80 cases tried uh, to a jury trial in 2019. Uh, those statistics were provided by uh, DA Mark Bennett. Uh, the issue mainly at hand is we understand that uh, the jails are already overcrowded because of the court systems being shut down and that this moratorium could cause more jail overcrowding. But uh, the flip side of this is uh, I currently house 114 inmates that are charged with some form of murder. And uh, if a the expectation is as we open the courts back up and there's 150 uh, days uh, to try those cases, there is no way possible uh, to try 114 murder suspects uh, in this one particular county, uh, which with current law, uh, basically if we go 151 days, uh, those individuals are released from uh, jail and can never be charged again. Uh, I, I don't think that that's what the legislation wants. I know it's not what the citizens of Kansas want, and that's why we're supportive uh, of this bill for uh, to extend the, the speedy trial as explained by both attorneys. So with that, uh, I will end my testimony and stand for any questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you, thank you, Mr. Easter. Appreciate uh, your testimony. And um, lastly, then we will hear from proponent conferee Ms. Jessica Glendening on behalf of the Kansas Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, Ms. Glendening, please introduce yourself and welcome back to committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Jessica Glendening, and I'm here on behalf of the Kansas Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. I don't have a lot to add to what the other proponents have said. Um, we're here to support the amended version of House Bill 2078. Um, as you all know, we're dealing with an unprecedented situation, and we have spent a great deal of time working with the County and District Attorneys Association to craft a solution to this concern. Um, the extended period of time that's being proposed is enough to ensure that all the cases are able to be brought. And Section K emphasizes the constitutional speedy trial provisions um, that are still available to defendants. And it ensures that the courts are going to consider those constitutional speedy trial provisions while, um, while we have this sorry my video stopped for some reason while we have this temporary stay of um of the statutory speedy trial provisions my primary purpose in being here today was to answer questions i know that the committee um when they had uh, as well as the the stakeholders so i wanted to ensure that we were here today in case anyone has questions for our organization Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Glenn Denning. Um, committee, please also look in your committee folder. We have proponent written testimony from Natalie Chambers, Kansas Attorney General's Office, and Greg Smith, Sheriff, Johnson County. So with that then, committee, we will open it up for questions for um, any of our proponent conferees. Senator Haley. Chair, and let me thank the proponents for bringing uh, back um, this reworked bill from the House uh, and, and looking at what we were contemplating in the Senate. I know that they've spent a lot of time in uh, finding some, trying to find some, some middle ground for the very thorny issue of constitutional rights, both state and federal, for speedy trial provisions. And I think we're getting there. Madam Chair, maybe I missed, I don't know if there's a question for you, because I'm going back through the testimony and now going through those who were both uh, proponent and neutral before. The one thing I'm still missing, and I'm digging through here, and I'm trying to read back, I'm still concerned uh, as a member of this committee and uh, of the conference committee if it ends up uh, passing about the date. Uh, and uh, we've heard from all of the conferees, I have missed, and maybe you can share with me where it is. I, I don't have in my notes, Madam Chair, where the necessity remains for suspending these rights for another three years when it still continues to be projected that we could resolve these issues as the proponents have brought, uh, that it's only the jury trials, and that's a small percentage. Have I missed? Where did did you? Could you point me to, before I ask the proponents, where it is there's a necessity to go another three years in suspending those rights in order to catch up? Thank you, Senator Haley. Um, I appreciate the question. Um, I didn't draft um, the Senate bill and. Um, so I didn't come up with the date, um, but I think that would probably be a very good question for our proponents who did come up with this compromise and to the agreed upon date. If we could invite uh, Mr. Bennett to the uh, podium, I think that would be a good place to start with answering your question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bennett, please introduce yeah. yourself and go ahead. Mark Bennett, uh, District Attorney, Sedgwick County. So if we start, let's assume for the sake of uh, we got to start someplace here. We've got, as Sheriff Easter said, I've got 115 homicides pending in Sedgwick County. We have 250 or so level threes, twos, ones, off grids altogether. Um, when you look around the entire state, we're 
north of 5,000 cases pending. Um, even if a smaller percentage of those cases go to trial, this is what was referenced earlier. We've got the balance of this year. We've got, uh, let's say you moved it, you, you bumped it down to two years, May of 2023 instead of 24. That gives us about 18 months roughly to get all the cases across the state tried. Um, let's assume that we don't try all 5,000 cases, and we, and we likely won't, even though the 115 homicide cases I've got. You know, we're down, we worked out 1,900 cases last year in Sedgwick County during, during a pandemic in, in 2020 calendar, 1,900 cases. So those remaining are the ones who aren't interested in, in pleas at this point, at least. So let's, what does it take to try a homicide? What does it take to try a level three, a level two, a level one? Number one, that takes 12 strikes per side. So I have to bring in not less than 36 people, assuming every one of them is qualified to be a juror. Defense gets to strike 12, I strike 12. That leaves us with 12 to sit on that case. During a pandemic, we all know we're gonna want alternates in case someone would get sick. So 38, 39, at the bare minimum, just to get one alternate. Um, now times that by 100, times that by three or 4,000 across the state. All those folks have to come into court. Let's also, I wanna pick up on something that, that Steve Howe mentioned a moment ago. I won't presume to, to read Ms. Glendening's mind, but I, I presume that this was part of her motivation in being uh, supportive of this, and that is level threes, twos, and ones, these most serious cases, we're talking kidnappings, ad, ad, kidna ad, excuse me, aggravated kidnappings, homicides, anything involving children. Um, that is a small, there's a small cadre of people in the state who prosecute and defend those cases. Um, to try, my, the biggest year I ever had was when I was fairly, fairly young and tried about 20, 22, 23 cases in one year. Uh, it's debilitating. And to try you know, three or four murders in a year uh, is about as much as somebody would ever take on willingly. Now we all know we're gonna have to step up and do more in the next year, year and a half. But the notion that we can, we'll just stack them up. It's only 100 murder trials over the course of, you know, it's 10 weeks, 10 judges, we could get them all knocked out. 10 judges maybe, but there's, there's about 10 or 15 defense attorneys in Wichita who are gonna be responsible for handling all those. There's about 10 people in my office who are gonna be responsible for handling all the prosecutions. Um, for us to do it effectively, ethically, and for the defense to give their clients a uh, legitimate defense, um, an effective defense, we cannot put those attorneys, prosecutors and defense attorneys both, in the position where they're trying 15 or 20 murder trials a year. And the final thing is all the forensic scientists and all the people who are, you know, really scrambling across from the KBI to go to every jurisdiction across the state. This has to be a rolled out, organized thing. Um, and so that's why we ask for more time for that three years instead of two. Madam Chair, thank you. Indulgence just for a second. And thank you so much, Mr. Bennett, for that. Was there a backlog pre-COVID? I mean, I mean, so you're saying, uh, is it your testimony, is it your assertion that all of this 5,000 cases now statewide. I'd say it's double. Occurred in, in, in one year, or was there not a backlog before one year ago today? In there, there's always, I mean, like, there's never a situation where you file a case and it's resolved the next day. So cases always take a passage of time, but I've been in the office in Sedgwick County since 97, so 24 years, or more than that almost. And on average, we would have 40, maybe 50 on a bad year, pending homicides at any given time. So, so, so to now to say 115, yeah, it's double what it used to be. Um, yes, the pandemic has in fact uh, doubled the, the normal backlog. We, could all, we would have maybe 600 cases at a given time waiting jury trial in Sedgwick County in 2016, 17, 18, 19. Um, 575 to 700 if things, you know, had a bad month or something. Right now, I've got over 1,800 cases pending. The sheriff said he's got 1,400 in the jail alone. So yes, it is not hyperbolic. It is not some contrivance to say that this, the pandemic has in fact caused the backlog that we're facing right now. Well, thank you, and Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Bennett, final point. I, you know, I, I just think that three years is too far out, sir. Uh, and, and I'm
to be honest with you, I, I, I really do, and uh, not because of those who are going to be found guilty ultimately of the crimes for which they're committed, but for those uh, exceptions to that rule that have innocently sat for an extended period of time for additional amounts that we would allow. I am hoping that the census that we've asked the chief judges of every district, and I know my chief judge in the 29th, uh, Judge Burns has, that will provide that census that shows that there's not but so much of an increase that can't be managed over a period of time that is not three and a half years out from now, three years plus out from now. And I hope that you as a proponent person whom I work with and respect tremendously along with the other conferees, including uh, defense counsel, might appreciate those who have the concerns that I do and may want to see that 2024 date roll back to something that the census from the various chief judges shows could be managed. I understand, and I guess my only pushback is to say that the practitioners who are going to be responsible for rolling this back, this isn't a uh, sort of an abstract idea to us. This is us sitting down and figuring out which bodies are going to go into which courtrooms and go try those cases. It's not uh, something we're just trying to pad for ourselves. Um, a lot of thought's been put into this due respect to the judiciary, we'll do what they say, and I'll absolutely thank you for whatever we get here. But um, this wasn't a, a, an amount pulled out of the sky. This is what the practitioners, the attorneys who are going to be responsible for pre preparing those cases, issuing those subpoenas, going into court prepared to do the business of the people or of the person they represent. This is the amount of time that we believe, honestly, is what it's going to take. Mr. Bennett, thank you so very much. And Madam Chair, I appreciate your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Bennett and Senator Haley. Yes, Senator Pyle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so listening to this conversation and the concerns of the Senator from Wyandotte, you're saying the cases since COVID have doubled. Is that correct? Cases have not doubled. The, the backlog, our ability to backlog. Cases, yes. So half of that backlog was already here prior to COVID then. Roughly. So if it doubled, basically half of it was already here. Well, looking forward, we're going to continue to have a caseload. It's going to come on and come on and we're right. I tend to agree with him on the date. Um, and I'm, I'm of the mind that uh, I would like to see the work. If we were to put a May of 22 date on here and next year have legislation that would extend that one year at a time and see and hear actual documentation of how we're getting the work done on these cases and actually shrinking that caseload. Um, I'd just like to, to hear your thoughts on that because I think that's, that's something that, uh, you know, I'm not saying we can't extend to 24 eventually, but if we go from 22 of May, and we come in here next year and we hear that you've worked through half of these cases and you're, you're actually digging into this and we're making progress, we extend it another year and at the end of that year, we find out, hey, you know what? We've, we've reduced that down, and, and we're getting it done. Um, and we give them another year then. But I'm just, I'm, I agree with the Senator from Wyandotte. I think that reaching out three years is just a little too much. So give me your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, and I'm you know, standing here with my hat in my hand. I don't have a, I'm not in a position to negotiate. If 20, you know, if a two years instead of three is what you're given, then that's what we'll take. Now, I, I'll tell you, I think we'll be back then, coming to you and saying we need more time. I would say 2022, one year, I, you know, I, I would strongly urge you not to do that. Um, that's nowhere, there's no way, no one is suggesting that one year will be enough to work this down. Um, that would put an, a, a burden on, and it's not, it's not just an abstract, we'll see how we're doing. No, because judges say, look, if I've got one year, I've got to plan as if I have one year. You have 25 cases right now that are set, Mr. Defense Attorney. I, I know it's going to break you. You're on for the next 25 weeks. Every other week, you're trying a murder case. Every other week, you're trying a level three. It's not something we can, well, let's see where it goes, because if I'm a judge, I have to set it with the expectation that the, that the law won't change. And so at least if you're considering bumping it back, go to 2023, make it a two-year instead of a three-year. Um, I would far rather say, because, before, because of the reason I just said, because judges are going to be setting things with what the bill says, not on what it might be a year from now or two years from now. And I would ask that you set it for three and then bring, bring us back. 
make me come back and prove that I still need that third year in 2023. So fair enough. I, I, that makes sense if that's what, if you're that concerned. Um, and so, you know, but don't make it sunset automatically. Uh, have us come back and, and have a reporting requirement or something where we could come back and say, is it still necessary to have that extra year? Um, that's doable, but one year, there's no, it, it would be devastating to the prosecutors and the defense attorneys to figure out, okay, how am I gonna get this work down in one year? Um, it's just too much. Okay. Just out of curiosity, if we were to ask for the information on just a case file number, how many of these were pre-March? I mean, I just heard on the news yesterday that yesterday was actually the uh, one year anniversary of the number 1,000 COVID cases in the United States. This is where they, they announced that. So if we took that date and looked at how many of these cases were actually there then, versus now from that date forward. Could you do that? I, I could do it in this way. Every case that's filed in Kansas is, starts with 17 CR, 18 CR, 19, whatever the year was that it was filed. So I can tell you which cases, how many cases were filed in 2019 and 2020 okay. versus those two. I could, I think the court could tell you how many 19 cases are still pending versus how many 20, 20 cases are still pending. So, I mean, I, I, it would be a little hard to get as granular as to say as of March 18th. I don't know that I could do that. The courts probably could. But I could at least say, here's how many 19 cases are still on the docket versus how many 2020 cases are still on the docket. Yeah. There's no way for me or a legislator or a research department to go in and there and draw a line and say, here are the cases. It's not that, oh, no, excuse me, there's not, as much, there's not that transparency it would take the court to do it. It could be, let's put it, could you go in and look? Mine, I Frankly, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you'd have to go in. You could, I don't think it's never been broken down like that, but you could say how many cases, ask the clerk's office. You could call the clerk's office of every jurisdiction. How many cases were filed in Smith County, in Grant County, in Sedgwick County in 2020? How many were filed in 2019? And then go to the judges and go, how many of those 19 cases are still on your docket? So I'm not sure you could do it at a glance, but it's the kind of thing that's almost, I wouldn't even say it's an open records request. It's just asking somebody who can crunch the data to, to do it for you. But all 19, all 2019 cases would have been pre-COVID, basically. Yeah, had yeah. to be. And, yeah. and so it would have just been the early 2020 cases that won it. I'm just, my, just, I'm, I'm, my thoughts are on the date, if we go to the fall of uh, 22, give 18 months, and then hear back that we're getting progress and that we're actually shrinking at a rate to where we can achieve that goal so that we don't have a backlog uh, because 2019 cases uh, carried into last spring and now being carried forward if there are such and I'm assuming there are based on what Some. you're saying. Um, are, we getting, are we getting to where we're going to be caught up uh, by May of 24? I, I, I don't think that's something we might all you want an update Consider. is what you're saying. As long as it's not tied to the fall in terms of sunsetting, because then it, I, I can't get in front of the legislature again. That's why we said May, just because it would give us a chance to get in front of that legislature. If you want an update in the fall, yeah, I think that's the kind of thing. And, and maybe done. that's where we just take the date out and say that there will be a report as to progress and, uh, and uh, further review as to, an ex to extending I don't know how that has to be written. I'm not an attorney, but I just know that I, I do have a problem with going out till 24. And, uh, so anyway, just some thoughts to express for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Uh, Senator Baumgartner, you better stay there, Mr. Bennett. She might have a question directly for you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to I want to thank. Um, you know, we had both. It was the charge of this committee that both sides get together and come up settlement, if you will, come up yes, with an agreement. Um, I, I think that you did hear loud and clear the concern, the time of the original hearing, um, so many years out. I, I guess one of the things that I would like to know is, um, and we don't have representation from any of the, uh, of our rural areas, and that, that was included in that original testimony, and the concern that it's not as if the judges are just there for that county, they actually serve multiple counties. Um, is there a potential, if it is perceived, let's say there's a ruling, um, 
on a case and it's perceived that well this was rushed through trying to meet this deadline that that would be used as an appeal on a ruling the, the this bill being rushed through no um if we were to move the deadline move it forward um, oh. so instead of three oh. years, two years would that be something that a defense attorney might use as an appeal that the process was rushed in every case every criminal case you have a right to an appeal and what's called the direct appeal is was my trial uh, handled appropriately then there's what's called the indirect appeal and that's the collateral attacks the primary primary attack being ineffective assistance of counsel and in every case there will be an argument that i was not you were not prepared to defend this client did you read all the documents did you speak to the witnesses etc and if we put defense attorneys in a position, I mean, if it seems disingenuous that I'm standing here trying to defend defense attorneys, I mean, maybe as blunt as I can, I don't want to have to, I'd rather defend them now here than to defend them in court three years from now, five years from now. Because if an attorney has, is in a situation where they're trying five, 10, 15 murder trials in a year, there will be arguments, there will be meritorious arguments that that attorney was not prepared, to, could not fully be prepared. To really tr be prepared to try a murder case, you need about, a, in my experience, a month at least. And that's uninterrupted. That doesn't mean a month before, that means 40 hours, four weeks in a row, uninterrupted, getting prepared for that, depending on the complexity of the case. And to suggest that a defense attorney can do that five, 10, 15 times in a year, um, it's just not realistic. And so, yes, if we have the shorter period of time, um, we are building in the risk of ineffective assistance of counsel claims. Also, I'm worried about my prosecutors. Um, no one's going to claim ineffective assistance, but if they aren't prepared to do the job that they're supposed to do because they just haven't had, they were in trial one, at week after week after week. I had one attorney two years ago, three years ago, who was in court 12 weeks in a row on six consecutive homicide and child sex cases just the way it broke down. Now, luckily for her, she had co-counsel on a couple cases. It was debilitating. I had to give her time off. I cannot begin to express to you what, what a um, drain that is on someone's uh, sharpness, on their intellect, on their ability to remember one case over the other. So, yeah, I mean, I understand the concerns for three years, and I certainly understand that we want to move cases through. But, it's like any project, any major project. You wanted to get the, the state house refurbished. I'd like to see it done in a year. Realistically, though, somebody has to stand there with that hammer and that chisel and that plaster and do the work. And at some point, we can say, well, work around the clock or whatever. There is, st there is still a limitation on how much a human being can get done in a, period, in a finite period of time. And that's really what the basis for this three-year re request is. I appreciate that. You know, Madam Chair, my concern had been, and I voiced this in prior when we worked the bill, the Senate version, um, the concern that in three years you could earn a law degree while you were sitting in jail. Um, but I, I think that uh, while we want speedy trials, I think it's more important that we have fair trials, be that for the person that's been accused, but particularly for the victims. And we're talking about Kansans. So fairness is important. And I don't want us to create this new cycle of appeal, 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 um, because things were rushed through. So I do believe that, you know, we're not even halfway through vaccinations in Kansas. We haven't even figured out how to get shots in arms in Kansas. Um, but once we have a larger population that has been vaccinated, I think that that will help um, from the standpoint of being able to have fully staffed juries. Um, I think that will help that process along. And quite frankly, I think we will have areas of the state that will get the backlog taken care of well in advance of the three years. Um, but I think we need to be very conscientious that the needs within different areas of the state are going to be different. Some areas will need almost up to the three years and others will need significantly less. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Uh, committee, do we have other questions for the uh, proponents? Yes, Senator Corson. Um, th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
I'm really having trouble with the, the 2024 date for all the reasons that the senator from Wyandotte stated and the senator from Brown stated, and I'm not going to repeat those because they did it much more eloquently than I would. But one of the other reasons I'm having such a problem with the 2024 date is we keep talking about we'd have to try these cases. These cases are set for trial. What we learned from the judicial branch is that the number they gave us was 1.3, 1.4% of criminal cases are getting tried. So we're throwing around these really large numbers about the backlog that we have. But when you say we've got 115 cases or we've got 6,000 cases, what we know is that in terms of cases that are ultimately gonna get tried, it's one to 2% of that number. Now I understand that you've gotta work those cases up. You've gotta assume that every case is gonna be tried. There's substantial resources and time that goes into working those cases up and getting them to a point where they're resolved prior to trial. So I'm not, not acknowledging that, but in addition to all the reasons already stated, that's another reason I'm having such trouble with this date is it's not like we're gonna try all of these cases. We know that we're gonna try fewer than 2% of these cases. I disagree, fundamentally disagree with that. Uh, we, that's, you're talking pre-COVID. The world has changed. If you're a defendant sitting in court in, in custody right now, and you're looking at saying a plea on a homicide case, number one, first degree premeditated murder carries a penalty of 50 years to life. So the best offer you're gonna get is maybe a felony murder to 25 to life. Take that offer. Or let's see if maybe my speedy trial rights were violated. You know how you pr preserve that? Try your case. You cannot plea and re preserve your right to appeal speedy trial later on. The only way you preserve that is if you try the case. Five years from now, I'm with you. We'll be back to some semblance of normal. But for the next year, year and a half, two years, if you're sitting in, that cust in custody, if you're sitting out of custody for that matter, you got a choice to make. Abandon my right to make an issue of this or not. I don't know that it'll be 100%. I'm not suggesting that. But 2%, I'll be, I, hope, I hope you're right. I hope it's 2%. But everybody's been sitting this long. There's going to be people who are, I mean, the defense attorneys have been very blunt with me. I'm telling my clients not to take pleas. Let's roll the dice and see. It can't get any worse for them. And so this notion that it's 2%, um, this isn't 2018. This isn't 2019. We're dealing with a different world than we were then. And let's, let's just say it's 5%, okay? Again, if I'm defense counsel, I have to prepare every case and give them a legitimate defense and be prepared to try that case. If I'm a prosecutor, I have to be prepared to try that case. If you, I get, I mean, that's all we're talking about is the three versus two year part of this. That is the sticking point. I mean, maybe I'm missing some other concern that someone's got, but that is the thing. My point would be, all right, two choices. Give us till 2024, give us three years, but put, add something in there that says we come back in 2023 and make our pitch. And if you're not concerned at that point, you reserve the right to bump it back. Um, my only thing is there's got to be a logistical way to do that. Meaning if we're preparing cases as if we've got three years and you suddenly bring us back to two, that'll throw things off a bit. But we could work those details out. The other is, I guess, give us until 2023 and ask, and if we come back, we're not ready, we could ask for another year, an extension. Um, I, I just got to fundamentally say one year is just, there's no way. Um, that's not being hyperbolic, that's just being realistic. But um, yes, three years, I get it, it's a long ask. But all I can say to you is, when the defense attorneys and the prosecutors are coming together, the ones who are gonna have to make this go, and we've come to this agreement, I would hope that speaks volumes about the reality of what it's like to practice law in courtrooms around the state. No, I, I very much appreciate that. But I mean, like I said, even if we doubled it, and even if we we're trying four or five percent, that's still a small, 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 small fraction of this backlog. And, and that just gives me a lot of pause when we're talking about something that's more than three years away. Also, just given the uncertainties, we don't know what vaccination rates will look like. We don't. I mean, it just the world is so uncertain right now that just giving this carte blanche for more than three years and saying goodbye, good luck for more than three years. I can't get my head around that. I'm speaking only for myself, but that just gives me a great pause because I think that everything is, as you've pointed out, is so uncertain right now of when we'll be able to do this, what rates will look like, and again, just the very small cases that, whether it's 2% or 4% or 5% that are gonna go to trial. So, but I appreciate your response and I appreciate all the hard work that went into this compromise. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Uh, Senator Baumgartner. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just two points uh, following up on the discussion. I have heard from defense attorneys, criminal defense attorneys, that that is their strategy. Wait it out. Um, it couldn't get worse. That they are literally using that as a, as a strategy. Um, I would say I, I want us to hearken back to the hearing that we had where um, judiciary came and presented. And part of what we did here and part of what we learned is um, I believe there was underfunding for retrofitting our courtrooms um, for these types of, of trials. And uh, we certainly know that there is more funding coming in from the federal government. And I think it's imperative that the judiciary needs to make sure that they have facilities that are appropriate and safe for the jury trials. I don't think we've come really close to making that ad adaptation. And I think we need to look at what are venues other than the traditional courtroom to make that happen. And we certainly know we've had plenty of vacant facilities. Um, I think that it's time for the judiciary to find a safe but reasonable location for some of these trials. And quite frankly, they haven't done that yet. They simply said what we heard what we heard from the Supreme Court representative was we received this much funding and we spent it. We didn't hear about this was the ask, this was the additional funding we needed, or this is the funding that would help us be able to um, have more jury trials. It was just this is what we received and we spent it. So it's time for them to get real. We know federal funding's coming in and they need to start making sure that this portion, this branch, um, is addressing this very real issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to say to that that in Sedgwick County, we've got two of our 28 courtrooms outfitted with plexiglass. We understand we'll have another eight shortly. The only last thing I'd say about that issue of, of off-site, you know, having uh, jury trials in gymnasiums and things like that is, I know my friend Jeff Easter on representing the Sheriff's Association would have his hand raised, maybe uh, virtually, say, I gotta run security in those places. So that's, that's one of the concerns, but I, I hear what you're saying. Thank you, uh, Senator Haley. Well, I appreciate this round table discussion and the various considerations. I won't be long uh, now because most of my concerns have been eased. I'm still not off of the date you talked about so far out. But Mr. Bennett, you did bring uh, some of the concerns you have for wanting to maintain the date, the well-orchestrated or well-negotiated, thank you, you told me about that, and I apologize, the well-negotiated uh, date for 2024. What, what, on the flip side, and I was glad to hear you argue on behalf of criminal, potentially on the criminal defense attorney side, but what leniencies or what kind of pretrial uh, release provisions um, could be further employed for enhancing, um, you know, I don't know, the compensation for not again those who are ultimately found guilty, but for those whose lives are changed because they can't go to their job or be with their family or if we keep the 2024 data, someone mentioned they could have earned a law degree sitting in, uh, in jail for a crime they didn't commit and they ultimately will be found innocent of. What other provisions can we do other than encourage with a shortened date, your office and the judiciary to bring these matters to trial? I mean, so what would you do understanding as you do, prepared to argue on behalf of the criminal defense, what could we do to um, provide those provisions that speedy trial at least helps alleviate a bit of? Well, this is, there's a lot to unpack with that question. Let me start by saying that the existing speedy trial bill as it is doesn't ensure a speedy trial. I mean, that's one of our concerns with the bill to begin with. I can continue the case 10, 15 times if I'm a defendant under the speedy trial. There's nothing that prevents that. So the bill needs to be reworked big, big picture. And frankly, Ms. Glendening and I have already promised we will sit down and do that hard work to bring you a bill coming out of this that starting in 2023, 24 and forward is a bill that actually gives voice to the concerns you're raising. Because if there was no COVID, if none of this had happened and the bill just proceeded on, 
our statutory speedy trial right, bill, excuse me, our statutory speedy trial statute does not ensure a speedy trial. It ensures that if the state continues the case for more than 150 days, the case is dismissed with prejudice. But it doesn't mean that a defendant couldn't continue for two and three and four years if he wanted to. So the bill needs to be reworked. And so the, the, the simplest answer I can give you rather than go through each of the individual things you said is this, this statute as it exists needs a fresh look, a, a, a look that addresses the realities of 2021, 22, 23, and moving forward so that judges can have a bill that says, if you really want to go to trial sooner, these are the steps that we will, we will go through to make sure that can happen. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you more offline. I, I don't want to overstay my welcome here, but that's probably the simplest thing I could tell you. And the promise I'll make you, and have, as I've already made to Ms. Glenn Denning, is we will engage with her association to bring you a better statute moving forward. This is the stay. I mean, frankly, it's kind of like just put the gun down and let us do our work for two years or three years. And then moving out of this, I don't think we had to go back to the old bill. We had to go back to a better bill. We'll work on that. We'll bring that back to you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pyle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I'm not for sure how to state what I'm trying to say here. So bear with me. But I'm being asked to extend a date. And as far as I know, I haven't seen any hard factual numbers of what we alluded to earlier, the 19 cases, the 20 cases, I think that needs to be in the record. And I don't know how or who would rate those on likelihood that they would go to trial, okay? Because we're in, a, a, somebody should be able in the judiciary to look at it and say, this one's highly likely to go to trial. This one, not quite as high. This one's got a low rate. It, it normally would be pled and, 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 and will be agreed to. But we need that so that when we come back and are asked and challenged and asking about progress or did we achieve our goal by extending the date to 2024, can we see that we have actually made progress? Or are we sitting at the same stagnant number or that number grew? We don't have a baseline. And my, my thoughts are we need a baseline and it needs to be in the record so that when we reference back to this change that we made, we can know, hey, these were the cases that were before us on March the whatever today is, 11th or 12th, and, and, and this is where we were at and it's in the record. I don't know whether that makes sense or not, but we don't have that. And I think we need that and I don't know who can provide that to this committee but we need something and we need someone to say, these are the likely cases. Now they may not want to make that judgment, but we need that. And, and, and then we can see, and in whatever date we come up with, if we put a date in here at all, maybe we just put in and say, here's where we're at if we get this information and we will review this a year from now and see what that number has done. How many have been added on as we move forward? We should be able to have that number. And we should be able to look at the number from the 19 cases that got resolved, the 20 cases that got resolved, and say, you know what? But maybe we just suspend it until we get that kind of uh, show in progress. I don't know. But I do know I don't have a base to go from that I'm aware of because I don't remember anything being entered in when we heard this Senate bill on this. So I would ask that we get some information and some hard data that we can base our decisions on and something that we can review and compare to when in the future as we go forward. And I don't know whether research has to make that request. I don't know whether the judiciary or the DAs, whoever comes up with all this, but, but get us some hard data to go by. Because I'm, I'm struggling with changing the date until I know some of that information. And I can see and know that, you know, I'm going to make a decision and I'm going to be able to look back on it and say, hey, look, we achieved our goal. We got through the work. Otherwise, I, I'm like, what are we basing it on? Come in here in three years and we still got the same, we've got a bigger number than we had when we passed this legislation. How do we know that? We, don't, we can't answer that question until we get a baseline here. So just expressing my feelings. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Bennett, did you have a response? I would only say that, in, so, so for instance, in my written testimony, I gave examples of the pending cases that are post-arraignment in a, in a dozen or more of the major jurisdictions, as just jurisdictions across the, the board from Franklin, Finney, Sedgwick, Shawnee, Pawnee, Reno, et cetera. So that's there. I've also seen uh, Chief Justice Lukert has provided with me something that's a far more robust look. I just asked friends in, in the prosecution bar, you know, what do you got in your jurisdiction? She was able to ask the judges in each judicial district. So I believe that is something that is in the record that was part of her testimony. I, I didn't watch it, but there was something in an Excel spreadsheet that gave you exactly what you're looking for. The final thing I'll say is, I don't believe anyone is gonna tell you that case is likely to go to trial, that one's not. We try murder cases, we try speeding tickets, we try um, low-level crimes that I can't believe are going to trial. We try, we get pleas on murder cases I never thought would plea. The, the, the fundamental thing is the criminal justice system is run truly by one individual, the defendant, whose rights are the ones at stake. It's an individual decision made by that individual in, co in consultation with their attorney. So for someone to come in and say, yeah, we think it'll be this versus that. Two years from now, three years from now, when we get back to more of a norm, as I've said to, to, to Senator Corson, yeah, we'll get back to a situation where far more cases are being pled than being tried. But right now in this situation, I don't know how anyone would ever say, trust me on this. I know how this is going to go. We've never been here before. And so um, likelihood of trial, cases that will likely go to trial, I don't think anyone would be, anybody who's been doing this for very long would want to be on record given that kind of a prediction. Madam Chair, is your compilation, the data that you gave us before that you're referencing, is the, that a total statewide number? I went, like I said, mine was based on counties I could get access to before I came up and testified in February. What I'm saying is I understood that the Supreme Court did give you uh, in, when you, I can't remember what day it was, the, when the supports came over and testified that there was a uh, attachment that was available. I, I, I didn't confirm that. I didn't look before today because I thought it was there. If it's not, I'll find out. But yes, there was an Excel spreadsheet that I understood was part of their testimony, which should have given you, maybe not by county, but by judicial district, you understand the distinction. Counties make up a judicial district. So whether they went county, 105 counties, or whether they went with the 20 some odd judicial districts we have, it's one or the other. And did it break down based on 1920? Uh, Pending. I don't know that it's... I don't remember seeing that, but maybe it's there. I'm not going to say it's not. So Senator, sure. this is a good segue into... Um, I have a copy that we can pass out. This was a letter um, from the um, Madam Chief Justice of the Kansas Supreme Court after the last hearing that we had that was sent by email, I think, to all um, committee members, I think. Um, not sure, um, but to pass that out today and make that part of the committee record, um, I apologize. Part of the, um, the printing of it is cut off a little bit on the um, right-hand side, but what it is is the Supreme Court, uh, you can see at the end of February, went and asked on the first page there, the second paragraph, the number of pending jury trials um, uh, in a, in a couple of the counties around the state. And I'm gonna also try to pull up the PowerPoint that was part of the Judicial Brands pre presentation by Sean Jurgensen, and he might have in that Excel spreadsheet that chart that Mr. Bennett refers to. to see if we have those numbers. Um, I'll ask the committee assistant if you're able to pull up the PowerPoint presented by the Judicial Branch at our last hearing with them. And that might help answer the number of questions. And again, that will be a little bit dated by now because that was February and now we're mid-March. So we'll pause for a moment and stand at ease if we can pull up that PowerPoint as well. Uh, the date of the Supreme Court uh, justice letter is February 25th. And I'm not sure um, of the email date. It was not an email um, sent by... Um, me or um, the committee assistant. So let me see if that was distributed by uh, the Supreme Court. Um, let's stand at ease for just a moment. In any event, I can distribute it to you by email now.
So we are um, online now. We have the PowerPoint presentation that was brought to committee from the judicial branch when they testified in um, February. And uh, if we could flip to, there should be an Excel spreadsheet um, about the number of cases pending in the counties across Kansas. And if it's not in there, I don't know of any other Excel spreadsheet we would have received. And that's the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, committee, you should have received um, by email the Supreme Court's letter dated February 25th, and we can also um, post that online as well as part of committee documents. I don't know, that probably doesn't help answer the questions. If we could have a research department, I don't know if that's data we can you know, track down because how are you going to determine this many are going to plea because circumstances change as the case progresses, as time wears on. Um, I understand the concern though. Um, and just not sure how to go about getting the data, and it might be data that's just not collectible because it is so um, hard to pin down, hard to put your thumb on it, because it's kind of a shifting um, target there. Uh, yes, Senator Corson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to note, because it kind of went to my point earlier, that in the first paragraph it says, Statewide, the judicial districts report that approximately 3,500 pending criminal cases are either currently, and I assume it's set for jury trial or will be. It is important to note that many of these cases will ultimately be resolved without jury trial. As noted during the testimony provided earlier, 1.13% of criminal cases in Kansas resolved through jury trial in fiscal year 2019. So I think that 3,500 number is probably the best statewide number that we currently have. And, and to my point, so if you did the 1.13 into the 3,500, that means you'd have about 40 jury trials statewide, 40 criminal jury trials statewide. Even if you doubled that number and you said you had 80, um, that is kind of goes to my point of why I'm having such trouble with the 2024 date because if you, even if we take this 3,500, 40 jury trials, double it, it's still 80. Um, that seems like, I don't know that you need three years to do these 80, case, 80 trials, understanding there's gonna be more added, but that, that just went to the point I was trying to make, so thank you. Yes, Mr. Bennett, you had a reply? Just say we tried 80 jury trials in Sedgwick County in 20. 19. So um, that was during normal circumstances. We try far more than, than uh, the idea that we're going to try 40 once things open back up statewide. I, I just think that's completely off base. I, I, I'm just using the numbers that we got. Those aren't my numbers. Those are numbers that the Supreme I, Court gave us. So I, mean, got, I just want to be clear. I've got 1,800 cases pending in Sedgwick County alone. So um, and in a normal year, we'll try 80 to 100 cases a year under normal circumstances, not with 100 people waiting jury trial on homicides, not with 250. So, I mean, I, I get it. I mean, I'm not expecting us to come to a meeting of the minds here. I just want to understand, I want, I want to make sure it's clear, and I think I beat this, you know, into the ground enough. The notion that um, we can do this in a year, a year and a half, I, I just, after 26 years of doing this, um, I've never seen anything like it, and I just don't think it's going to be and normal next year, year and a half. I th last thing I'd say, as I know we need to wrap this up, I understand there's an urgency, there's a, a desire to, to maybe amend some things here. I have three weeks. This isn't an arbitrary date. Three weeks is when this ends. Um, you know, I would hope the governor would drop everything and sign this once it's through. But if there's an amendment, the way I understand it goes to the conference committee and then it would have to pass the Senate again, and or excuse me, then it would have to you know, go that route. There is an urgency to this. I have three weeks, and so whatever we do, um, my preference would be you pass this and we come back and take, take a stab at it again if you don't like what's been going on. Make us sing for our supper in a year or two. Uh, and if you don't like the progress that's been made, you could change it then. Um, if, if that's not the case, okay. 
but I would urge you to work this as soon as possible, get it to that conference committee as soon as possible so that it could be passed in whatever form the, the conference committee deems appropriate so it could be signed before the end of this month because if I, when that date hits, it's gonna be a all hands on deck mad scramble in every courthouse across the state and in that situation, I guarantee you, everybody in custody is gonna go, I ain't thinking of nothing because I don't think you can do it. And the answer is they'll be right. Thank you. Committee, other questions? All right, seeing none, um, we don't have any neutral conferees signed up, but are there any um, neutral conferees in the committee meeting room or on WebEx? Seeing and hearing none, uh, we don't have any opponent conferees signed up, but are there any opponent conferees in the committee meeting room or on WebEx? Seeing and hearing none, we will close the hearing on HB 2078, and we are, um, we're still at a quorum, so uh, we could turn to working the bill. Um, and I don't believe we'll have, we might not have a quorum tomorrow to be voting and working on the bill. So um, we did hear from um, Sedgwick County District Attorney, we need to um, work with some urgency on this. March 31st is rapidly approaching. Um, we still do have a quorum here. Um, I would like to at least, um, and we're running out of time in committee as well. So, Senator Palmgarner, do you have a comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. I know there's been a lot of consternation about the date, and should we build in that they have to come back and give a report? Now, at any given time, the chair of judiciary, the chair of any legislative committee can call for a hearing. And so I think it's totally appropriate um, that we set, be it second week of legislative session next year, that we're gonna get a report, we're gonna get an update, we're gonna see real data. Um, but for us to tell the two groups, the two sides of the issue, to come to a resolution and bring it to us, and they have done that, I think it's a little difficult for us to second guess that. Um, I understand there's concern about length. We're putting a deadline. It must be by this date. Not that it can't be done sooner. And I think we, again, we will see areas where they will work through that backlog and be through it much sooner than what is the deadline, the end date. Um, so I, I don't know. I know that we have a quorum. I don't think that we uh, that we have anyone that's had an ability to write any amendments for this. Um, so I will make a motion that we pass it out favorably, and I guess we will see if it passes out or not. Um, yes, um, Senator Corson. I would just offer that I, I do have two amendments that are, are ready to be offered um, whenever is appropriate. Um, I think it's appropriate. Um, we don't yet have a second for the motion. Um, Mr. Reviser, is it appropriate to proceed uh, with amendments or what's the proper procedure with we have a motion made but not yet a second? Thank you, Madam Chair. Jason Thompson with the revisor. Uh, since you don't have a second, you could just have the motion, motion withdrawn and, and go ahead with the amendment. Yes, Senator Baumgartner. Well, Madam Chair, I don't even need to withdraw it since there's not a second. Then it's, we didn't act on it. So it's fine to move forward with an amendment. Okay, thank you. Um, Senator Corson, you have an amendment? We will then, let me um, also state for the record then, um, we will begin working um, House Bill 2078, so maybe the motion wasn't yet uh, in order in any event, but um, yes, yeah, Senator Baumgartner <laughs> will correct me if I'm wrong, but... Uh, the motion's always in order. There you go. <laughs> Do 
You want to explain your amendment, Senator? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So this is um, an amendment um, that would change the, the date of the suspension until May 1st of 2023 instead of May 1st of 2024. Um, I think we've all talked about our different feelings about that, so I would sort of, I'm not gonna uh, argue for, for the amendment. I, I think everybody know, has expressed views about it, but just wanted to consider it. That's um, my view of, of a good date, and we could certainly always come back, and if we needed another year, um, having heard testimony and having been presented with the sort of uh, data that you know Senator Pyle and others have talked about, I, I think if that proved to be necessary, we could make that determination, but this would just be a simple change uh, from May 1st of 2024 to May 1st of 2023. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would move my amendment. Um, thank you. Uh, discussion on the amendment before we, um, we don't yet have a second on the motion, but any discussion on the amendment? Looking for any discussion on the amendment? Madam Chair, this is Jason Thompson. If I could have a moment when you're ready. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Reviser. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the balloon that was referred to as the date balloon is the one I just sent and I thought was being passed out. It has a different date. So I just want to make sure which date we're talking about. Thank you for clarifying, Senator Corson. I, I apologize, Mr. Advisor. Um, with the chair's permission, I changed the date of our amendment um, to reflect May 1st of 2023 based off the testimony that we received uh, today at today's hearing. And so it is the same amendment that you and I had worked on um, but with the chair's permission, um, I changed the date and that's what is in the the I made it change by hand in what was given to the committee members. Thank you. Thank you. And for further clarification, um, the request was made about the amendment um, while we were here in committee regarding um, generally procedurally amendments uh, need to be run through the reviser and that's why the copy that the reviser has is different than what has been passed out by Senator Corson in committee, so during committee, he said, I need to make a bit of a conceptual change. Is it all right if on the hard copy, I change the date by um, pen and make a different date? And I said that that was okay to change it by pen, not um, indicating my uh, agreement or disagreement one way or the other with the amendment, just with the procedure of how the amendment would be presented. And then with that, um, any discussion on the amendment? Senator Pyle. Madam Chair, I've already expressed concerns with um, some of these numbers, and I still have those same concerns. I'm reading over what you passed out from Chief Justice, and, you know, larger numbers of pending jury trials, some estimated. You know, it's not hard to put in a database on a spreadsheet the cases for 19 that are there, still out there, the cases for 20 that are out there, and get us that data. So whether or not I support this amendment, I still would like to see that spreadsheet. I don't believe we have it. I don't think we have it in our past testimony. I have yet to see it. This has estimates in it. There should be no estimates on those prior dates. You ought to know the hard numbers. And I don't care if it comes in by county or by judicial district. But we need some hard data to base on. So if we do change this date next year, we come in here and say, we want to see the results. We want to see the progress. We want a report of progress. We can look at numbers and have some factual data. I don't think that's too much to ask. The courts can provide that. Thank you, Senator. Um, if we have Natalie Nelson from Kansas Legislative Research Department, uh, on WebEx, would that be something that the Kansas Legislative Research Department could get those numbers from each county? Hi, this is Natalie Nelson from Legislative Research. Um, I can I can ask um, the judicial branch to see what they can um, do. I did ask 
um, the last time we had this hearing um, about the statewide numbers. So we have the statewide numbers from 18, 19, and 20 um, for felony and misdemeanor cases um, that were filed in those years. Um, as far as the, each county, that would be um, that I'd have to I'd have to request from the judicial branch. I think on that level, uh, Senator Corson, and then Senator Baumgartner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to note that I have a second amendment that is prepared that is meant to address on a going forward basis the exact issue that Senator Pyle has raised. And um, whenever is the appropriate time, I will offer that amendment. But it, it is very much meant to capture the concern on a going forward basis that has been raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't think that, have we received that data that was requested and that's been provided from a statewide standpoint? Thank you, Senator. Um, we just looked through the, um, the PowerPoint presentation from the judicial branch. Uh, we distributed the letter from the Supreme Court, and that's all the information I believe that has come into committee. Um, yes, Senator Baumgartner. Um, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I'm making reference to what um, legislative research just said, that they had from 2017, 18, and 19. I didn't think that we had received that. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, Ms. Nelson, have we uh, received that in committee? I don't recall, but doesn't mean <laughs> my recollection is wrong. Uh, no, you are. This is Natalie Nelson, Legislative Research. You're not um, wrong. I provided the information to Senator Pyle um, in direct reference to when he, requ when he requested that information in committee. Um, I don't know when that was, but I had, had just sent it to him because it wasn't a committee-wide request, I didn't think so. But I can definitely forward that on to the whole committee. Yes, I think the information requested by Senator Pyle would be helpful to the whole committee. Are you able to forward that now or would that be later? Yes. Yep, I can do that. Okay, great. And are we able to then um, post it online as well for those watching at home? Um, I can send it to um, Iris and then she can post it. Yep. Great. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are we meeting tomorrow? Uh, the question was, are we meeting tomorrow? We are scheduled to meet tomorrow. I have heard that um, a number of committee members will be joining us on WebEx. Um, I believe we will have enough here for a quorum, and I don't want to run over too late in our committee meeting time now, which um, expired about three minutes ago. So um, with that committee, um, I think we have another amendment, but um, I don't want to um, infringe upon anyone's time inappropriately. So um, I'll, I'll take a comment from Senator Haley and, and Senator Pyle, did you have a comment? And then I just wondered if we have a motion on this amendment before us, kind of along the same. Um, good point. I think Mr. Reviser can clear up that we have a motion uh, on the amendment. I don't think we yet have a second. We don't yet have a second. So I'm sorry. And we have a second from Senator Pyle. Um, so, uh, discussion then on the motion, Senator Haley. Um, Madam Chair, and I'll yield. I don't know if there was a follow-up because she's still, uh, Senator Baumgartner, I don't know if that, she was still you're good. So, thank you, Madam Chair. So, my concern is this particular date. Um, I still have the concern. I appreciated the original, uh, time that was listed, you know, 2023 for the record is, um, 26 months from now, uh, May of 2023, 26, 27 months. I just continue to feel, which is what this calls for. It's, uh, it's better. This isn't an auction. They're, these are people's lives uh, that we're talking about that need to be um, dealt with in, the, in, the, in a trial. And I was 
comfortable with the June 30 date, 2022, that's in the original um, amendment. I was not privy to the Senator from Johnson, Senator uh, Corson's changes to adopt an additional uh, 11 months uh, on top of what was appropriate, I felt, by the June 2022 date. So I know it's been seconded. I know it's been debated. I know that this will go to conference. I know we'll have a bite uh, at this on the floor to discuss this should this bill pass as amended. Um, I just would hope that we would at least start from the position of expecting the courts and our prosecutors and our defense counsel to do the best they can to bring us back to normalcy with a realistic period of time and to give that 15 month June 2022nd date instead of enlarging it as this current amendment does. We'll see how it goes. I may support it or I may not, but I, I, I probably am closer to supporting it than not. Are you uh, is, that, I, is that a substitute motion or I, I don't think there was a substitute motion there. Sit on the toes or step on the toes of those who prepared it, but this is being drafted on the fly. Uh, by scratching out and putting it in here. I, I appreciated the original amendment as drafted. And I won't bring a substitute motion, but I certainly would not discourage one from being brought. Thank you. Committee further discussion on the amendment. Senator Gossage. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, doing a lot of listening about all of this and what I heard from testimony is that they're going to go as quickly as they possibly can. Don't know what they could find as to a reason to drag their feet, especially a defense attorney, to try to get someone to trial. Um, I agree with what Senator Baumgartner said about if you as chair or anybody at, in any year could be able to pull them in and ask them if they could do this. Personally, I feel like date the May 1st, 2023 might be a good compromise, given that we've had some people who wanted 2022, others who want 2024. I said from the testimony, of course, can't possibly do it in what is considered one year, but they'll do their best, you know, to go to 2023. Um, I would probably vote for this amendment because I feel like that we do, there is an urgency here. We do, do need to get something out of this committee. We have some who want to go to 22, others who want to go to 24. My thoughts are that I would vote for this amendment for the 2024. Thank you, Senator. Other discussion? All right, seeing none. Oh. Senator Corson. I'll just make one, one brief response and as something came up, um, you know, I do applaud the parties of coming together and there was that sentiment of wanting to honor the compromise, but you know, I think that there are other interests that we should take into account as a committee and as a, as a body that may be separate. And one of the things is obviously securing justice for the victims of crime, not saying that that was not part of the discussions between the two parties, but I think, you know, obviously the criminal defense attorneys want to make sure that they were able to provide adequate defense for their clients, which is understandable. The prosecutors wanted to make sure for their work workforce that they had a setup that worked for them. But I do think that there is a, 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 an additional interest in making sure we're timely securing justice for victims of crime. And there's also a really compelling interest in making sure that these are taxpayer dollars at work and making sure with some oversight by this committee and, and by this body that our taxpayer dollars are being used in the most efficient, effective way to resolve these cases justly and swiftly. So I would add those additional things that I think we should consider. Thank you. Senator Pyle. I'm gonna make substitute motion to go with June 30th, 2020. And my reasons for doing that is this bill is gonna to go to conference if it's amended. And I am very reluctant anyway. I'm not sure whether I'm going to support this bill or not because I really have s strong concerns about suspending constitutional rights. Whether you're doing it statutory or whatever, it's still a constitutional right. Um, 
I think Senator Haley makes a good argument. So does Senator Corson. I'm not opposed to his current amendment. Uh, I think the date needs to be changed to get it to conference. But our position as a Senate going in is much stronger if we go with the 22 date, because then there leaves you some wiggle room, Madam Chair. And you may come back with this May 1st date of 2023. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to make substitute motion whether it makes it or not. I'm not I just want to make that motion because I'm going to argue for a less, at least I can tell my constituents I tried to make it as short as possible uh, for the suspension of your statute, your rights. And so that's why I'm making the substitute motion. Thank you. Um, could you please state your substitute motion? Substitute motion is for the original date that is in this amendment, June 30th, 22, that is struck. So it would just be that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there a second? Second, second. Senator Haley. Um, Mr. Reviser, just want to make sure we're on track here. The substitute motion um, is appropriate and has been seconded. So we're on the substitute motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jason Thompson with the revisor. That's my understanding. Uh, you had a motion and a second. We have a substitute motion and a second. And I've shared the original language of the balloon for everyone on WebEx. June 30th, 2022 is the new substitute motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson. Um, so, committee, you've heard the substitute motion. Um, it says um, originally drafted in the um, balloon amendment shared by Senator Corson to move the date to June 30th, 2022. Discussion on the substitute motion. Seeing none, then. Um, Committee then, um, I'm sorry, Senator Pyle, would you like to um, close? Madam Chair, just when you go to conference, you're going to have two dates. You're going to have the date of the House, which is 2024. And if we put an amendment in here, you're going to have the date. This is a stronger position for you with 22. It's a good position. And it gives us time to review data a year from now to see what movement we've seen on the court cases. When we get that number, we'll have a hard number, and then we can look at it next year and see what the hard number and see if there's a change. We still have time next year to come back and move this date to 2023. We have that time. If we go with 2022, we have time. We just merely need to stop the three-week problem that he's uh, argued for here. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll move my amendment. Committee, uh, you've heard the motion. Uh, all those in favor, aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Uh, it seems the motion fails. There's been division called. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. Seeing two hands, uh, all those um, voting no on the motion, signify by raising your hand. Seeing three hands, uh, the motion fails. We are back on the bill then. So are there any uh, amendments? Madam Chair. Or excuse me, yes, Mr. Thompson, are we back on the motion uh, before the substitute motion? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Jason Thompson with the revisor. You'd be back on the motion to amend with the date of May 1 of 2023. There we go. Thank you. All right, committee, we're back on the motion to amend to May 1st, 2023, as distributed by Mr. Cor or excuse me, Senator Corson. Any discussion on the amendment? Uh, seeing and hearing none, then uh, would you like to close? Yeah, I think we've had a, a, a very appreciative of, of Madam Chair for the uh, time that she has devoted to this important issue. I think that we've had a lot of uh, chance to talk about this this date, and so I'm not going to belabor the point. But um, I think this is a good date that both respects the hard work that went into the compromise that was brought to us, which I very much appreciate, and but is also a date that at the same time shows the urgency with which I think this committee and I think also the Senate as a whole feels about continuing to expeditiously resolve these cases. So I think it's a good middle ground that both expresses urgency while also respecting the hard work that 
our conferees did in, um, I think, putting together a, a much better um, bill. So I think the May 1st, 2023 date is a good one. And um, with that, I would move my amendment. Committee, you've heard the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed signify by saying nay. The motion passes then. So we're back on the bill. Uh, is there another amendment? Madam Chair, this is Jason Thompson. Could I ask, is this the, what's the title of this one? It's reporting. Do you want to explain your amendment, Senator? Um, Mr. Reviser, do you, do you, would you be willing to explain the amendment? Thank you, Mr. Reviser. Uh, sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I believe you have on the screen and now handed out to you uh, the amendment about reporting. Uh, you'll see in the title, it fairly well explains it, requiring each judicial district to provide a report to the legislature in 2022. And then on the uh, final page of the bill, it would add a new subsection requiring the chief judge of each judicial district to make a report to this Standing Committee on Judiciary and the House Standing Committee on Judiciary on or before March 1st of 2022 with the following six items of information um, involving pending cases, cases resolved, jury trials, new cases, status of criminal defendants, and a summary of plans and capabilities to resolve backlogs. That's the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, committee questions for the reviser? Senator Haley. Not so much for the reviser. I guess the question, uh, not for Mr. Thompson, was, we had a census of what we had prior to 2021. Um, I, I like this. I like the way this is going. The, the amendment is, but just wondering again, as was brought up, what do we have pre-COVID? Uh, because we're alleviating or asking for the census of COVID and onward uh, cases accumulated. But how customary are we alleviating a problem that isn't, was maybe pre-existent? Thank you, Senator. I think um, Ms. Nelson from Kansas Legislative Research Department just had some numbers from um, 17 and 18 and 2019, I think, about where we were on cases. Is That would probably answer your question a little bit. Did you, were you able to distribute that, Ms. Nelson, or do I have that wrong? I haven't received it, but that's okay. It's not relevant or directly germane to the question in front of us. I just would like to know how we're mitigating pre-existing problem by having the, uh, the annual report turned in? Or were there annual reports prior to this? Is this a new law? Is this a new, do we already have them? Do we already get these, these, um, do we already get these reports? The from question is, do we already get these reports um, from, the we from the judiciary asked? branch um, on a yearly basis? That would be a question for um, Ms. Nelson if we already get this information. Or maybe Mr. Uh, Bennett. This is uh, Natalie Nelson, Legislative Research. Um, as far as I'm aware, so the state the judicial branch has a state of the judiciary annual report. Um, I don't believe that it it breaks it down um, by judicial district. Um, I think it's just a sort of a an aggregate of all of the cases filed in the state. Um, I'm sure that. They, there's that information is somewhere, but the report that is publicly available on their website has is a statewide. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Bennett. Mark Bennett, District Attorney. I just point out the Sentencing Commission every year issues its annual report. You can get online and go back uh, 10 plus years at least. It breaks down the number of cases filed, resolved, per county, by, by the type of case, by male, female, race. I mean, Kansas has a unique uh, opportunity to have all that information. You can go back for years. Has he seen, Mr. Bennett, 
Has, uh, Madam Chair, have you seen the proposed amendment and how might this information differ from what we already have uh, by 2022? How might the, uh, what do we, if we add this, how is it gonna differ from what we can get from the Kansas Citizen Commission already? It will, they'll give you the number of, like I said, cases, final cases resolved. Number one, how many are pending for jury trial? That would be something, I think they'd have to be more specific than that. I don't know that there's a line item for that. You could kind of divine what they're saying, but that would be something more specific if you wanted that specific number. But it'll tell you how many were resolved, how many were filed year after year. So, yeah. Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do we have a point of clarification? Is it calendar year or fiscal year as far as that reporting? Thank you, uh, Mr. Bennett. Uh, fiscal, I believe it is. That's the, the uh, state runs on. Do you have a follow-up? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that we would need to make that correction. Um, and I, I will point out, because I believe we are talking about the amendment, correct? Yes, Senator, we're on the amendment. Okay. I would say right off the bat, my concern is um, that notion of Reporting on March 1st, I think that puts us right in the midst of the week of turnaround. And so um, that really loses that opportunity for any type of legislation. So that is oftentimes why we require that reports be on or around January 15th, because that's roughly the start of a legislative session. And so I think that that those would be um, two edits that I think that we have to have, um, not opposed to this. I don't think it, it's a reporting mechanism that's obviously available, um, just not from judiciary, but I think we can make it. Um, in fact, I think before this bill is on the Senate floor, we could probably um, get what was shared with us that's already been prepared in that and the report that comes from the Sentencing Commission as opposed to from Judiciary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Corson. Um, Senator Baumgartner is, is correct, and I view those um, changes as, as very friendly changes to this amendment. Um, when I had originally drafted this amendment, I was looking at a May 1st, 2023 date. I then had the June 30th, 2022. So I was trying to capture as much, um, make the data as most as recent as I could, which is why we did March 1st. But I agree that um, going to January 15th for the reasons stated um, makes sense. Uh, I would encourage us to make that change. I also, um, the change about the fiscal year, I think that um, also makes sense. Um, and then Madam Chair, um, because again, this was drafted with the June 30th, 2022 date. Would it be possible to modify the language to reflect that we would want these reports because we're now going to 2020, May 1 of 2023? Would it be possible for the revisor um, to just modify this to capture that we would want these reports in both 2022 and in 2023? Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Thompson, is that something um, the, you, the revisor, can do? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Jason Thompson with the revisor. Um, yeah, I think so. If, if the committee is clear that it wants fiscal year 21 and 22, uh, I would need the second reporting date. I guess that would be January 15 and 23. Um, I could redraft this uh, to, to accommodate two reports and two different sets of data, maybe. And require it that it be fiscal year. If that's if that's the wish of the committee, I would view that as a friendly change. If that is more consistent with how data is typically reported, um, I don't have a, a preference and would leave that up to the will of the committee. 
committee is there. Um, Mr. Reviser, if you could state clearly where we are then on the amendment so the committee can be clear on um, what we'd be looking at. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jason Thompson with the revisor again. Um, I'm not exactly clear on where the committee is. Um, my best notes so far are that the balloon amendment has been passed out and offered. I don't have a second uh, noted um, unless I missed it. Uh, and we were discussing potentially amending the date and adding a second date and going to fiscal year. And so it's all very uh, conceptual at this point. Thank you. Um, do we have a second for the amendment? Senator Pyle, not a second, but a question. I have a question, Madam Chair. I'm looking over the amendment. I don't have a problem with the Janu January 15th date. I do, however, um, think the first five points are relevant to the amendment. Um, not that the others aren't. It's just that some of it's a little, like, uh, in item 6B, the plan in the judicial district for prioritizing cases the House has already amended in the prioritization that's in the bill. And um, a plan to resolve backlog of cases. I mean, evidently we're here. I hope they have a plan in place to move forward and start processing these cases. Um, I just, I like the first five points of the amendment. Um, and I just, um, I'm tempted to make a motion to divide the amendment once we get on it and uh, to look at it to separate and then just uh, divide it because I think the first five points are, are relative to the report. Thank you, Madam Chair, just some thoughts. Thank you. Um, don't yet have a second on the motion. Is there a second? I'm not seeing any, so we um, are back on the bill then. So um, any other discussion on the bill? Yes, Senator Baumgartner. Madam Chair, I hate to add to the burden of our reviser. Um, I think that we would be best served um, to get actual changes to this amendment, such as fiscal year, the date, address the issues if the carrier of the amendment is willing to, as far as striking those portions on six. We are meeting tomorrow. Let's have a clean copy before us. Um, that would give, you know, we do have one third of our committee is missing. Um, so if we are really wanting to vet this, I think that would also give us an opportunity between now and tomorrow, we could get those um, last two, this year and last year's annual report from the Sentencing Commission, um, which is the information that um, I agree with Senator Pyle. Um, should have been a part of all of this testimony to begin with. I think that we would be able to have that in front of us. And um, any additional information, particularly our, our largest counties that seem to have the largest backlog, um, perhaps we can have some of that information of pending cases specifically from, um, from the counties that have district attorneys. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Baumgartner. Senator Haley. Regrettably, Madam Chair, I, I, I knew that we were pro forma uh, tomorrow, Friday, and made plans um, um, back in the district, and we'll only be able to join, to join us by Re WebEx. I did not know committees are going to be held on Friday uh, this early. The committee would have been this early in the turnaround. Um, however, um, I will look forward to whatever the committee does produce with 2078 is currently amended and will certainly join you in that on the floor, the discussion. I would hope the bill will pass out uh, tomorrow. I'd hoped it passed out today, but uh, certainly that it will pass out and I'll greet it at the floor and I'll greet it in conference to tweak whatever changes we might further make in conference committee. Thank you, Senator Pyle. Um, I don't know whether there's any other amendments, but um, and I can't remember what county you're from, Senator Corson. <laughs> Sorry, but I don't think I don't see a problem with this date of January 15th and the first five items. If the senator would bring that on the floor, I don't have a problem with kicking the bill out and doing that in the committee of the whole. Um, 
I think I think most people here would support that amendment on the floor, and uh, it would get the bill out of committee and get it moving and resolve the problem of having to work this bill tomorrow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, committee, there, it's been suggested that we have a clean amendment to vote on. Um, um, the reviser has kind of indicated that conceptually it would be cleaner to have it all set forth um, in that kind of measure. Um, I do believe we will have a quorum tomorrow. It might be a little bit different quorum, but we will have um, a quorum present. Um, so with that, I think it needs to be clear and transparent about what we're doing and what we're voting on. So I would like to see the clear amendment um, before the committee, before we vote on it. So um, I would ask if there are other amendments to bring, um, please have them cleaned up and ready. We will, um, we will be meeting tomorrow, um, and if we um, have amendments before us that we can discuss, it will be uh, on the agenda for final action on bills previously heard, and this would be one that we would be considering. So with that then, we will um, keep open our working on House Bill 2078, and I thank everyone's um, consideration and time. Um, we went far over today, but this is an issue that this committee has been seriously looking at. Um, this is at least, this is our third hearing on this, I believe, and um, both on the Senate bill and the House bill, and we are uh, working diligently on this on this issue from both sides, the, the prosecution, the defense side, and um, trying to strike that right balance. So with that then, committee, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>